Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to my talk. My name is uh, Lev Isrovich, and I work at DHR Research. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a disciplined approach to debugging. So um, first, a quick word about uh, myself and my company. Um, so I work at DHR Research. It's a um, independent research lab founded in 2002 by David Shaw. He um, used to manage a hedge fund, also called uh, D. Shaw, but now he wants to advance uh, science and um, specifically using molecular dynamics. So the high level goal is to advance, to make an impact in the fields of biology and chemistry using computer science and computer hardware. Specifically, we build a, a supercomputer called Anton for molecular dynamics simulation. Um, I'm not going to be talking about very much of that in this talk, um, but what I do is system software. So basically, kind of operating system level software for this uh, supercomputer that we built. And uh, during the course of this, there's definitely um, a lot of things break, and you have to debug a lot of things. Um, I've generally had about 20 years of experience in the field working at places like uh, HP and um, um, Sienna, networking company. So I've worked for everything from like little embedded devices to obviously supercomputers. And uh, hopefully I could provide some uh, good background on debugging techniques and tools, specifically under Linux and embedded Linux uh, more particularly. So first of all, why do we want to talk about debugging at all? Well, about half. If you're a programmer, about half your time is spent doing administration tasks. So things like you know, filing bug reports, talking to other people, HR, and you know, all sorts of things that go along with working in an office or at home, as the case may be now. And uh, uh, half and half of the time that uh, you actually spend programming, half of that time is actually spent debugging. The so these statistics you should probably take with a grain of salt, but um, there's about 1.5 million software developers in the US, and the total wages estimated by the US Department of Labor Statistics is about 150 billion. So about 37 billion at least is spent debugging in the US, and yet there's not that many resources really formally to uh, teach debugging. If you look at the MIT course catalog, the word debugging only appears three times out of 10,000 words. Um, I'm seeing some questions that people can't hear me. Is can is everybody can uh, people uh, speak up if or type in a question if uh, anybody else can't hear me? Okay. Sorry about that. Great. Thank you very much. I see some responses that uh, we can hear you. So whoever can't, that must be something on your end. Sorry about that. OK, so let's continue. Um, so before we even uh, start talking about debugging, um, it's, you really want to start first by testing. And uh, you know, even before you do any debugging, you should probably do testing. Unit tests, integration tests, basically the more expensive your um, uh, software, the more testing you want to do, because debugging is always more expensive than testing in the beginning. Uh, and uh, generally about writing software, I love this quote from Brian Kernighan, one of the authors of uh, the original book on C. He says that everybody knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing a program in the first place. So if you're as clever as you are when you write it, as can be when you write it, how will you ever debug it? Um, on the question of will these slides be available, yes, I'll, I'll uh, ask the, um, the Linux Foundation organizers, and we'll, I'll make them available after the talk on the SCIP page. Uh, so basically, my approach to debugging is basically I wanted to give it a clever title. So to reproduce, observe, and bisect, which spells Rob. And this apparently is a character in the a video, Nintendo video game called Rob. But basically, the idea is we want to reproduce the problem that we're seeing, we want to observe and get as much visibility as we can 
into the problem and bisect is to find where the problem lies. So what, why do you want to reproduce instead of just starting to debug right away? Well, generally when the users report bugs or when you see, um, you know, when you see a bug happen, you generally are missing a lot of information. Um, there's a very low signal to noise ratio. Users don't really know what that you want to know about the bug or why it happens. They just say, oh, this broke. So to properly instrument and observe and figure out what happened, you really, um, like the most important step is to reproduce the problem. In, in fact, even if you think that you can look at the code and find the fix and say, oh, you know, I'm pretty sure this is what happened, you don't really know that you fixed it until you've reproduced it, then tested it after you've fixed the bug and uh, say, yeah, this really fixes the problem. A lot of times you, you can think that you found the problem, but you didn't actually. So until you produce, you can't actually know for sure that you fixed it. So observe, what, um, what am I talking about here? Basically, you want visibility. So the visibility is the, the first most important thing is to reproduce the problem. And the second is to have visibility into the program, into what you're trying to uh, debug. So the picture over here is the very first bug found in a uh, um, computer in the 1950s. I believe it was in the ENIAC. Um, and it was an actual bug that got fried in one of the relays and uh, created a short. And the little, the little bug was taped over there, a little piece of tape to the paper. So uh, to find these bugs, you need visibility into the program. You could use it in lots of different ways. You know, The simplest one is just put a lot of print statements in your program. Um, a better way is to use a logging framework. I have some links here to some very nice ones like uh, in C, C, C++ is Google's G-Log. In Python, there is a great logging module included. Um, you can log to the system log from the shell using the logger command uh, or just redirect all your output to a file. You, you don't want things to disappear. So whenever you have something that could produce output, you want to drop it, some drop the output somewhere. And uh, when um, there's logging aggregators like Splunk or Elasticsearch. Um, I really like Splunk. It's uh, very nice. And it, it's a way to aggregate logs from lots of machines. And then you can kind of um, uh, see what's happening on many different machines at the same time if you're running in a cluster and so forth. Um, and the last point is asserts. Asserts are your friends. If you're sure that uh, something is true at a certain point in the program, put an assert there because you never know what can go wrong and it'll provide use, a useful stopping point if things have gone insane. Um, so one of the, some, there's lots of great tools in Linux. I think in Linux, basically, you have tons and tons of tools to have visibility. And uh, the biggest problem is like which tools do you actually use to get visibility to your program. Um, the best, so the first thing I do generally when I need to debug a uh, Linux application is to use strace, which traces the, all the system calls that a um, program is making. Uh, GDB, of course, there's great, lots of great resources about GDB. Uh, GDB is also useful for debugging core files if a program crashes. Um, don't forget to debug with, um, to compile, sorry, with debug symbols. So there's the dash G option to GCC. And you can do a man GCC and it'll describe all the various debugging options. But in general, debug symbols don't add um, uh, they add a little bit of size to your executable. They don't slow down your program at all. Um, so if unless you're in a very tight embedded system, you really do want to compile with symbols. Another trick that you can do is if you are uh, if your executable space is very tight on your platform, you can compile once with symbols and once without. So once you compile with minus g and once without, the two binaries will actually be um, interoperable, meaning you can if you use GDB server on the target and the GDB client on on the uh, on your developing platform, um, you can actually use the uh, program file with symbols to debug the one without symbols. You can load up the symbol file from a different file. Uh, you can also use the file command in GDB. So if you you started running your program with the one without symbols, you can then use the file command in GDB to load up the symbols from, um, from one 
Um, I have a question is how can we debug if from uh, Pankaj, I believe, how can we debug if Linux is stuck in booting? Uh, for that, you need KGDB. Uh, there's good resources on that. Um, it, but you need a second computer to attach to the first computer, or you can use the built-in KGDB debugger. Uh, so you should just Google KGDB and uh, follow the um, instructions there. Um, always use WALL and uh, WAIR. So that's to turn on all warnings and all errors in GCC. Um, they're generally super useful. It doesn't hurt to turn them on. And uh, um, the things it's fine sometimes seem pedantic, but it's generally a good idea to fix all of them. A word on uh, uh, reverse debugging. Um, it's pretty cool, but I practically haven't found it really super useful. Um, once you kind of know what you're looking for, you can like restart your program and get to that place from the from the beginning instead of going back. Other people may have had different experiences. GDB does support some level of reverse debugging. There's also a uh, tool called UndoDB. Uh, we'll also talk about Wireshark and TCP dump. And uh, if you're debugging any hardware, you want to um, you want to get visibility into that protocol. Okay, um, so I'll skip that. So this is a uh, Linux performance observability tools from Brendan Gregg. Uh, he's an engineer at Netflix, and he has some great resources on his web page about all the possible visibility tools in Linux. There's way too much to go into uh, right now, but you can definitely go on his website. He gets, gives great overviews of uh, what to look at. Um, and finally, bisect. So the idea is you want to do a binary search. Once you find that there is a um, problem, once you've reproduced it and you can observe it, you now want to do a binary search to find out like where in the code the problem actually is. So one way to do this is to kind of say, um, if you don't have an idea, make an educated guess. If you don't have an idea where it is, just guess, you know, first half or second half of the program. And then you could just disable the other half, run it again, see if you hit the bug, and uh, iterate. Uh, you could do other things to like switch things up. You could switch compiler optimization levels. You could switch tool versions. Generally, whenever you do these things, do one at a time. Don't try to switch too many things at a time, because then you won't know which one of those actually caused the problem. Um, and you also generally want to, what I like to call the trust stack. You should trust your program the least. Um, you should trust libraries that you're using are probably uh, have been tested by more people than just you. So they're probably more trustworthy. The compiler, the OS, and the hardware in that order are less at fault. It's always you know, a kind of you always want to blame the computer or uh, the hardware or the OS of being wrong, but most of the time that's not the case. Although sometimes it is. So I like to classify bugs into um, hard and soft errors. So the hard errors are actually easy to find. The hard errors is when you have a crash or unrecoverable error. So things just go off the rails and break. And that's generally pretty easy to reproduce and um, easy to figure out what happened. The soft error is kind of an intermittent error, and those are terrible because you don't really know that you fixed it because maybe it just didn't get lucky and didn't happen again. So what you want to what you want to do is you want to try as hard as you can to reproduce the error and to turn that soft error into a hard error. So how do you do that? Well, tracing and logging will give you an idea. Um, you could look at external events. Um, like uh, logs, network, CPU load. Uh, you could try to replicate the error message that you see. You could stress test the application, or of course you can use GDB or the debugger. Um, so I'll give a few examples, and then I've, I'm going to answer. I've seen that there's a lot of questions. I'm going to try to answer most of them at the end. Uh, so this was an error that we saw that it's a, a weird error. Um, is an, it looks like an I.O. error in the program. So it's highlighted there in red. You can see the output. So we run an executable, and it says uh, boost file system reports input output error. So input output error is caused by an EIO. And generally, this is very hard to reproduce because this is generally only caused by bad hardware or uh, bad network NFS shares. Um, it's intermittent meaning when it's bad hardware, it won't always give you an EIO. So how do you reproduce something like this? 
Well, um, I actually tried to reproduce this first by just removing the file, but it does not result in the same failure. Um, the call works just fine and says the file is not there and doesn't cause an I.O. error or anything that causes the program to crash. Well, I looked at uh, errorno.h that can be found in user include as some generic errorno.h on any Linux uh, distribution. Um, just look for an error code that's similar. There's one called eloop, too many symbolic links. You could simulate that by making two links. You link file A to file B and a symbolic link from file B back to file A. And then when you cat A, you get this error, too many levels of symbolic links. Well, I could run, try running a program against that. And then I wrote here a test program that does this, the call that failed boost file system exists on an non-existing file foo. And in red, try it on, a, on this too many symbolic links file A. When we run the program, the first line outputs, normally foo does not exist. But on the second one, it throws an error and says terminate called. So that, that shows you that C++ threw an exception. Now, why would, it th why would checking for an existence of a file throw an exception? Well, if you look at the documentation for boost, it turns out that somebody decided that it's a really good idea to return one if something exists, zero if something doesn't exist, and in some cases, as specified in a whole different long legalese page of called error reporting, in some cases, it'll throw errors. This is a really terrible idea, I think. But you know, um, but uh, we found what the error was. And uh, there's a different version of the exists call. This does not throw exceptions. So we just switched to using that. I don't know why they decided to do that. A different bug. Um, we start a program and it fails to start. And it gives us useful error message saying that Intel MKL, which is the Intel uh, math library, could not load this uh, library. Well, you know, that's straightforward enough. But then you check, is that library actually there? Oh, yes, it is. What? How? Why is it not failing to load the library? This library is not on NFS. It's not, it's on a regular disk. So why would the program fail to start when that library is actually present? So the second step would be to observe, to try to figure out what is going on here. So like I mentioned before, strace is great for doing that. You could look, you can run your program under strace if it's reproducible. Um, you'll see what it's trying to do. So I took an strace of a working run of this program and a uh, failing one. And when they begin to diverge is that first red line when it does a get CWD. Get CWD is a system call that gets the current working directory. So when you type uh, PWD in your shell, that's what it does. It says, where are we right now in the file system? And it's getting an eno end. There is no such file or directory. So that's weird that it's checking its current directory and the current directory does not exist. And then soon after you see the right call, Intel MKL fail error, which is the one that we're looking for. So why, um, why did that happen? It looks as though something in the MKL library really, really wants to know which directory you're in. And if it can't find, if it gets an in event on the current working directory, it fails with a really confusing error message. So let's try to, to uh, to check that this is really the problem. So when you bisect, we make like an educated guess. Let's make an educated guess and write a test program. So this little bash script makes a directory test. Uh, the parentheses here say in a subshell, you wait for a uh, one second and then you run the program. That, that was the failing program for us. Meanwhile, in the top shell script, and that's uh, the ampersand here do, says do this in the background. So it's going to execute another subshell in that subshell, it's going to wait a little bit and run the program in that directory. Meanwhile, in the main program, we're going to remove the directory that that subshell is executing under. And then we wait for everything to exit. And sure enough, when we run this shell script, we get the failing error message. So now we've reproduced it and found the actual error. So MKL really doesn't like when you remove the underlying directory. Homer Simpson is very upset. So GDB, um, so GDB is really great at um, debugging anything. It can actually debug probably any language you can think of. 
Um, anything that's compiled by uh, GCC, which is not the GNU C compiler, but now the GNU compiler collection, um, which compiles basically any language. And it can also uh, debug things with LLVM, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you can GDP a live process as well as um, you know, start. You can start a new program for debugging, or if you have a process that's running, you can GDB the process with the PID. Um, you do have to be careful because when you do that, it um, put it stops the process. So if it's something that's important to keep running, you probably don't want to run GDB on it directly. However, what you can do is you can use the GCore tool um, that will generate a core dump. A core dump is basically an image of the register, the memory of the running process. So GCore will cause the uh, program to dump core to generate that image without stopping the process. And then afterwards, you can use GDB to debug it. In fact, GDB from the core file can even pick up which executable it was. So if you're not even sure, uh, if you don't remember which version of the executable or which one you ran, uh, the path to the executable will be in the core file. It has really good thread support. Um, you can look at the man pages. It just uh, um, you could do um, commands that to look at all the threads or apply a command to all the threads. For example, the bottom one here is a thread apply all backtrace. So the backtrace command will then be done on all the threads in your program. Um, it's, it has very good support for debugging embedded programs, which is particularly useful for this, um, for this conference for embedded systems. You want to run something called GDB server, which is this very small several kilobyte stub um, that can just trace the program. And then all the command line and uh, all the other processing in GDB is done on a client. Um, so the GDB connect command, you could uh, look up the manual pages for GDB server and I'll explain exactly how to do this. Um, a very useful feature if you have memory corruption. Uh, th this happens a lot where you know that you've, some memory has been trashed. Um, there is something called watch points. So this is kind of like breakpoints, except they break if something has written or read a certain um, value in memory. This is super useful for um, when you know that in your program something is going to corrupt, so something's going to write memory, but you don't know what it is. Um, you should keep in mind that what you really want to use are hardware watch points. Um, the x86 architecture provides four hardware watch points. Um, other architectures provide different numbers. Some don't have any. You really don't want to, if you use more than four, or if your architecture does not provide any hardware watch points, your program will get really slow because then GDB has to intercept basically every memory access and check if it's it for the address that you're watching for. Um, but if you're using the hardware watch points, then the processor um, at native speed will just check every memory access and break if, uh, if you've tripped on a watch point. Conditional breakpoints are also super useful. You can break um, on a certain location, right? It's like a regular breakpoint, and you can give it a condition. So you say any condition that's evaluable by GDB. So my variable equals five. So you say break on this location if, and then you give the condition to give. Just uh, keep in mind that GDB will actually take the breakpoint and evaluate the condition every time. So if it's something, it will slow down if you're going to be hitting that breakpoint many, many times. Um, you, you can observe, you can do commands at a breakpoint. So if you want to print out a bunch of things, every time you hit that breakpoint, you can use the command keyword and give it a bunch of lines to do um, after that breakpoint. Uh, finally, a useful feature is catch. Um, this is useful to, for C++ specifically, but could also be used to catch forks or signals. Uh, in C++, it's very useful to catch exceptions. Um, it will, it will breakpoint you as soon as anything throws any exception. So uh, here's an example of debugging a hanging process with GDB. So we had a periodic hang where we run this uh, big application and every like 10,000 uh, jobs, and this application runs for like 30 minutes. Um, and periodically, we see a hang where it just stops there. And we have a timeout after two hours that kills the application. So the first thing we would try to do is to reproduce but we couldn't figure out which, um, which inputs would uh, actually cause it to hang. So we added code on the scheduler level. So that's the, the process that starts our application. 
to monitor the application. And if we see no output for about 10 minutes, then we use G-Core to ask to get a core dump of the application, and we can debug, debug offline later. Now, core files that are produced, they're really big because there's lots of memory that a replication uh, uses. However, they zip very well. In fact, when your program runs, it'll use a lot of memory, but a lot of that memory will be zeros or repeating bits of uh, text, and gzip will compress it really well. So we use GDB to analyze the core dump file of this hung process. And uh, when we get into GDB, you type info threads, which will tell you where each thread in the application is. This one has lots of threads. All of them are in um, one that thread one is doing something interesting. Um, the rest of them are in pthread can't wait. They're wait waiting on some pthread condition. And one of them is stuck in read. Now, read is a blocking system call, meaning when you call read, you will not return until you get the results of the read. So that's interesting to follow up. Um, that could be a reason why it's hanging. What is the read blocking on? So we'll switch to thread number three, the one that was uh, blocked, and um, see what's going on. Now, you see this is in the libp thread implementation. That is not compiled with debug symbols, so it can't tell us which registers um, or sorry, which uh, what the vec, what the arguments, sorry, what the arguments for the read call currently are. However, we could. Um, oh, I have a question. How do we know it's stuck in read? Well, the reason we, we don't really know it's stuck in read, but we can look at things that we think it could be stuck in. Glob64 is the only other function here that's uh, not the thread can't wait, and Glob64 is a very simple. Um, function. So that doesn't seem to be something that would be stuck in. Read is the only function here that should take any amount of time. Um, so if you look at read, what you can do is you can type info registers. When a core dump is generated, it also dumps all the registers at the time. And uh, if you look at the Wikipedia page for the x86 calling conventions, it'll tell you which registers are used in a system call or actually in any function call. Um, I've highlighted them here in uh, green, blue, and purple. And uh, read takes three arguments. And if we look at the registers of those arguments in that thread, the green one, RDI, is zero. The blue one, the second argument, is some pointer. And the purple one, RDX, is four. So that corresponds to file descriptor zero, some pointer to a buffer, and a count of four. And in fact, the application does have a read of four bytes, but it's supposed to be reading from a socket. How, but file descriptor zero is standard in. And that's a good explanation of why it's waiting. It's waiting for input and standard in, which is not actually connected to anything. This is a uh, offline application. Um, so looking at our server, it turns out what happened was in this, uh, in this application, which is a server, there was a cleanup function that closed the socket and uh, um, a different thread that was in a loop and waiting for the thread to exit. Every time it went through the loop, it would do a read. If the read returned an error, it would exit. Otherwise, it will go and process the data. And basically, there, there was a race condition on exit. Um, if you close the socket and then cleaned up the C++ object, the M socket um, variable could then be reused by something else. Um, the thread that was looping will then use the M socket. It turns out that something set M after the main thread exited, something reused the memory and set the M socket variable to zero, which is just some garbage value. And the read from any other garbage value would have returned an error right away, and, and the, the reader thread would have exited. However, a read from zero from standard in would get stuck waiting for somebody to type something in on the console. Uh, the fix here was easy. It was the two green lines that added an exit flag and a wait for the um, reader thread to exit. So I promised I'd talk a little bit about Wireshark. Um, I'll try to get a little bit of that in. Um, Wireshark is great at debugging any sort of network events when you have uh, anything you have to dump with a network. You have to do with the network. Uh, you could use TCP dump, which uses, which uh, is a command line tool to gather uh, network packets, and then you can visualize them with Wireshark. 
Uh, keep in mind that uh, language to specify what you're capturing is slightly different for TCP dump and Wireshark. And in fact, Wireshark uses the same um, libpcap, which is the underlying library that TCP dump uses. So the capture language in Wireshark is also going to be different than the filtering language for viewing. Um, so you could do a man7 on pcap filter, that's for capturing, and man4 Wireshark filter, that's for viewing. They're very similar, but slightly different, as you can see in the slides. Um, but you can capture a specific port and a specific host and then analyze it later. You want to capture as much as you can without overwhelming the network, without it uh, overwhelming the kernel, sorry, when it's uh, capturing all the packets so it doesn't drop packets. And then you can analyze later to see what you see. Uh, conveniently, Wireshark, when you open it, it's a nice GUI. It'll break down all the packets for you and show you in different colors all the various things. It could follow TCP streams even, or it could give you the whole conversation. So over here, I'm not sure if anybody can see, it's pretty busy. But uh, the idea is you want to look for the red. Red and black things are the errors. So over here, there's a get of a uh, HTTP get, which Wireshark can conveniently decodes and prints over here um, circled in blue. Um, and then a few times later, we see a, H a, a TCP retransmission. So it's highlighted by Wireshark, and I've uh, put a little red uh, highlight around it. Um, basically, when you see a TCP retransmission, that means the previous packet was lost. So um, we see there's packet loss on this link. Finally, a word about hardware debugging. Um, again, observability is what you really, really want. If you're debugging I squared C, PCIe, any sort of USB, any sort of um, hardware um, interface, you want to get a tool that can give you visibility on that hardware interface. Uh, for I squared C, I've listed several debuggers. Saley or Beagle analyzers are all good. Um, USB, a little known fact is that Wireshark can actually uh, display USB traffic, and you can snoop traffic on the USB bus with the following commands. You do mod probe USB mon, and then TCP dump, and the interface is going to be USB mon 1, 2, 3, or 5, depending on the number of uh, your USB bus. So your computer can actually snoop traffic on the USB bus, output it to a file, like a regular TCP dump um, on the network. It could just uh, dump USB packets, and Wireshark supports looking at those packets afterwards. Uh, if you're using PCIe or NVMe, SATA, any sort of high-speed interface, you can use a logic protocol analyzer. Uh, LaCroix gets, makes great protocol analyzers for PCIe. I've used them. They're uh, super useful, also super expensive. Um, so I'll give one example of a hardware debugger. Um, so we had a, a Xilinx FPGA that was controlling an I2C bus. Uh, once every several days in production, um, we would have devices that would just stop responding, and we didn't know what was going on. So the one step was to reproduce and figure out what the heck is going on in this I2C bus. So we increased the polling frequency of our temperature sensors and so forth that were on I2C bus and uh, to sense them every second, um, every, sorry, tenth of a second instead of every 10 seconds. So that increased the probability of hitting the air about 100 times. Now we got hangs like every few minutes, and we can actually uh, reproduce this in the lab and attach a I squared C analyzer or a, a logic analyzer to this. Uh, we couldn't get visibility into the Xilinx FPGA because the IP block was encrypted. So we used an external logic analyzer and just hooked the probes onto the wires of an I squared C bus. And I squared C is slow enough that you could do this on a regular analyzer. Now, this is not the capture from the actual analyzer that we took. Uh, but this is a very similar problem I found online. Um, so on the top in, in yellow, you could see the clock. The clock is uh, one that the price per has two lines, clock and data. Basically, clock will always clock up, down, up, down, up, down. And the data will be ones or zeros, as you can see on the green at the bottom. Um, so um, if you look at the zoom region that highlighted in red, um, as the clock here is rising pretty slowly, and as it rises past the threshold of where it switches from, the clock switches from a zero to a one, there's a little glitch there. You could kind of see where it glitches past. Now, if your device, and a lot of ice c devices are supposed to unglitch this, they're supposed to allow for slow rise times, but not all of them really do. 
uh, if you see glitches on your clock line like this, you could get an extra clock cycle detected by your hardware. So your hardware thinks that another clock has been issued on the bus, and then everything is off by one because the thing that's sending the I2C signal thinks that it's only clocked once, and the thing receiving it thinks that things got clocked twice, and everything breaks. Um, once we saw this, there was a very easy solution, which is to put more pull-up resistors on the bus to increase the rise time. There's a good uh, link here from debugging I2C from Texas Instruments that um, discusses similar problems to this. Um, so again, the point of this is you want as much observability on the bus that you're developing as you can. We would have never caught this just in software without actually looking at the uh, logic analyzer. So that's all I got in the time allotted. And now let me try to go through some questions uh, that we had. I think I answered some of them, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through some of them. So I'm not sorry in advance if I mispronounce your name. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, we have some comments from second. Okay, are the slides going to be available? Yes, we'll post the slides. Um, uh, so there's a comment that's saying that from Steve um, that uh, a cert is actually really easy uh, to use and doesn't really provide a uh, runtime. Um, cost because it compiles away in a release build. That's a very good um, point to make. Uh, if you have a release build where you really want a cert to keep your certain release build, you want to have your own implementation of a cert that won't get compiled away in the release build. Um, how does Leandro asks, how does LLVM claim compare to GCC in terms of debugging? Um, it uh, GDB supports LLVM Clang. Um, I think I think there is basically no difference in LLVM Clang, but I could be wrong. I don't have that much experience with LLVM. Um, Steve also points out that there's other useful warnings from GCC, like uh, W shadow and W all doesn't turn them all on. That's true. Um, w all is basically a good starting point. Um, it'll turn on most of the warnings that you care about. There are other warnings you might be more pedantic about. And there's also other code coverage tools like Coverity um, and other tools that you could use to do static analysis on your code that could catch even more things. Uh, uh, Lachken, I think, sorry, uh, asks if I can elaborate on reverse debugging. So reverse debugging is um, basically, it will allow you to step your program backwards. It, as your program executes, it records state of basically how everything was, and then you can you can step backwards. So instead of doing next in GTB, you do previous. It will step back in time. This does incur a cost because it has to record the state of your program at every point, and it can't undo things like packets you sent in the network. It can't take those back. I'm not sure if it can then do file writes. That also seems uh, difficult. In practice, I really haven't found it to be super useful. Uh, uh, Bracha, Bracha Dumbbell, sorry, if I mispronounce your name, asks, well, will G-Core work even when the process is hung? Uh, yes, G-Core will work even if your process is hung. And in fact, that's very useful. Um, if your process is hung, however, you can cause, you can just attach to it with GDB directly. You don't need to take a core dump. But if you do need to, you can use G-Core. Um, Gavin asks, I experienced rare 3% memory corruption that is caused by a uh, task race condition on a MIPS processor. Is there a good case for GDB server and hardware watch points? Um, yes, if you have memory corruption, watch points are great. Um, make sure that your hardware, again, supports watch points because your uh, Otherwise, you're going to impact the timing, and your program will run really slowly. Um, you, you don't need GDB server if you can run GDB natively on the target. If your target, again, is too small, then you want to run your program under GDB server and then use a GDB client to connect to it. And then um, it'll work just like regular GDB then 
in the client. There's just a bunch of setup that you have to do. Um, F. Umson asks, what correlates the two log entries? I think you're referring to the TCP uh, entries here, I think. Uh, what correlates them is you have to look at the addresses of the sender and the receiver. So look at the IP address of the source and the destination and the port. So basically, your tuple in uh, TCP is your source destination, source port, and destination port. And uh, those those are going to define a connection. And Wireshark can also filter. You could just like right click on any one of these uh, entries and say follow TCP stream, and then it'll only give you packets that correspond to those particular hosts and that particular uh, combination, that particular TCP conversation. Joe asks, does any packet sniffer support I/O on Windows? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't have that much Windows experience. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Shiva Marthy asks, are, am I covering F-Trace? Um, I am not in this talk, but there is uh, lots of great resources. Uh, you could look on Brendan Gregg's website, like I mentioned before, um, or you can you can, you, you can um, just Google it. There was a good talk yesterday um, on the debugging GDB tutorial that covered F-Trace as well. If there's going to be a uh, um, like an offline way to watch it, I would suggest watching that. Uh, Pankaj, Pankaj asks, why were the glitches in SCL line occurring? So this is in an I2C. Uh, basically, the more devices, an I2C is a um, passive bus. The active device pulls down the line. And then when it's not using the line, it lets go of the line and lets it float back up to uh, to its full voltage. That's why uh, the resistors on those lines are called pull-up resistors, because they're pulling the voltage back up from 0 to um, uh, to the line voltage. The more devices you put on there, the more the more capacitance there is in the line, and the slower it will take to re to get back from voltage of zero to your desired voltage. Um, so you need a lower resistance on the line, basically, to pull it up quicker. Uh, this happens quite a lot um, in I squared T buses. There is different solutions that are discussed in that uh, TI document. Uh, he also says the drive strength of GPIO could have changed the rise time. That's true. Um, however, again, the, the, the uh, I squared C is driven low, not driven high. So your drive strength would have caused the second, but the drop off line to be slower. Here, the drop off line is pretty fast, but the rise time is pretty slow. Uh, Rachel asks, do I use fault injection testing to support debugging? Um, Yes, there. Um, in fact, the, the TCP um, error here was done using fault injection testing. Um, I find Docker, con Docker containers are super useful for this. Um, you can start things up in a Docker container and um, cause it to drop packets. You can cause it to um, power off the machine entirely or to hang it or to hold it or to cause all sorts of errors. They are a bit messy and annoying to set up, and they're not super useful on um, embedded systems because it's kind of hard to set up a Docker container for a different architecture on the host architecture. Um, but if you're debugging in the same architecture, I think containers are super useful for false injection testing. Jorge asks, how do you analyze a core dump? Um, so basically, what a core dump does is it, it takes a snapshot in time. And then when you run GDB, you run GDB your program and the core dump. And the GDB will load up your program as though it was instantiated at that point in time when the core dump was taken. And then you can look at the registers. You could look at memory. You can't advance time because it's, just, again, a snapshot in time. But you can use it to look at the current state of the entire program, examine all the variables and uh, registers and threads and what everything was going on on that time. Backtraces will work. It'll tell you, like, for each. Um, thread, you can see what the backtrace is, who called who, and what your stack looks like at that point. Uh, Emil asks, 
uh, recommendations for tools for debugging multi-threaded applications. So GDB is really good at thread support. Um, if you have race conditions and things like that, you can use uh, Valgrind and Helgrind. Helgrind is a subset tool of Valgrind that tries to detect race conditions in your code. And it's generally pretty good. It does slow down your code a lot by like 100 times because it's effectively, it's almost like emulating uh, the CPU. Jeremy asks, are there any tools for debugging PC transactions besides a PCIe analyzer? Um, are there any tools that can record data on the bus that could be seen by the root complex? I'm not aware of anything. You need a really fast um, Snoop sort of capability to um, log what's going on on the PCIe bus, and most processors don't have uh, that much um, that visibility into the PCIe bus. So other than a PCIe analyzer, I'm not aware of anything that would capture all the transactions on a PCIe bus, unfortunately. Uh, we have a question of uh, Thomas asks, GDB has a lot of hidden power, but there's very many accessible and clear resources for, isn't very many accessible and clear resources, resources for discovering it. Um, GDB has a super useful help interface. So just typing help in GDB and then perusing the different sections that it gives you, sections on breakpoints and trace, trace points and watch points are all really useful. The, the online manual is actually quite good. Um, I would also just check out the GDB documentation on the GNU website. Uh, there's a good O'Reilly book on GDB as well. Um, Andreas asks, is there any tool to dump and observe HTTPS traffic? Unfortunately, because of the nature of HTTPS, uh, unless you capture it before it's encrypted, there's really no good way to um, observe HTTPS. It's supposed to be secure to prevent you from observing it. Um, Orlin asks, are there any tools with a GUI on top of GDB? Yes, there are several uh, GUIs on top of GDB. The most common one is DDD, the Data Display Debugger, I believe. It's pretty old and clunky, but it, it, it's workable. Uh, Eclipse supports GDB as a backend, so it can be a GDB GUI. Uh, Microsoft uh, Visual Studio Code supports GDB, and it can be the front, the GUI for GDB. There's so lots of tools uh, support GDB on the backend. Uh, you, the user GDB text interface. I just like to use the text interface, but I know other people prefer the GUI. In fact, GDB has a kind of GUI text mode. I think it's minus Q. Um, it shows you your program in like a curses window. So it's a combination of text mode and GUI. Andre asks, do you recommend using debugging flags on production baseline compilations? Um, I, you, you should always uh, do minus G. That doesn't really add any time to your program. Um, it does add symbols. So it adds a little bit in your image size. Um, compiling with less optimization, however, uh, will make it easier to debug because things will be more sane as you step through them, but it will um, add a lot of, you know, it'll slow down your program, so I don't recommend doing that in production. Um, so Lechen asks, is there, um, in general, standpoint, are there any formal techniques to debug a program? Uh, there, like, uh, instead of test, observe, locate, we can uh, infer a bug for how a program was written formally. There are There is some research about it. I don't know if anybody who actually does this much. There's basically static analysis tools that try to catch um, bugs. Basically, this is a, you know, a way to write code that, that's less buggy is uh, what probably you're looking for. Uh, there is some research on that, I, but it's beyond the scope of this talk, as you've mentioned. Uh, Ancore asks, are there any recommendations about debugging Linux kernel driver interrupt related issues? Uh, KGDB, which is built into um, the kernel, is is useful. Uh, the kernel generally provides um, oh, what, one interesting thing in debugging the kernel is there is a uh, proc kcore file. Um, that will give you the current core. And you can use, if you have your Linux build, you can use um, you can use GDB to actually debug the live kernel 
uh, you can't step through it, obviously, but you can look at the current, um, effectively, core dump of the kernel and uh, see what its state is. Or you can use the built-in KGDB tool. I'm going to do one more question, and then I think we're out of time. Um, so uh, CRA asks, um, in some cases, the process may get hung in the kernel that could prevent user space dump from either happening or completing. A full kernel dump should be used in cases like that, right? Um, uh, that is a good point. You can try to use the proc k core, which gives you the uh, the kernel core file. Well, if you're if you're in a state where your kernel is hung, it's pretty bad. Uh, generally, those watch watch dogs effectively in the kernel that uh, tasks that get scheduled periodically and will print out um, back traces in your uh, var log messages or or var log current or D message. So all, all of those are kernel logging uh, locations. Um, and you can you can try to analyze what happened for bugs in the in drivers and so forth. Uh, so I think we're coming to the end a lot of end uh, time of the talk. Um, if there is more questions, I see there's a few more that I wasn't able to get to. Um, you can continue the conversation in Slack. There's a 2-track-embedded-linux um, track, Slack channel for this track, uh, where I'll, I'll monitor it for a while. And if anybody has specific uh, questions, they can ask me there. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you uh, learned something during this presentation. And uh, um, I hope to see everybody uh, um, in a year from now at an actual in-person conference. Thank you very much.